welcome everyone. My name is Anthony Greider and I am the Learning and Development Specialist for the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence, CSAFE. And on behalf of the team at CSAFE, I want to welcome you to the first installment of our Spring 2021 webinar series. Today we have uh, treatment of inconclusive results in error rates of firearms study. Today for the, uh, the conversation, our speakers will be the director of CSAFE, Alicia, and joined by Susan and Heike. All three of these individuals have been working with CSAFE for quite a while and have been doing extensive research and are, are leading this uh, firearms and tool mark analysis for the, uh, the results in the study that you will hear from today. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it to uh, those three to start the conversation. Anthony, thank you so much. Um, so this is um, the first webinar in our series for 2021. And this is joint work with Alicia Kirikiri and Susan Vanderplas, um, treatment of inconclusive results in firearms error rate studies. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how error rates for firearms evidence and case studies are defined in the first place. And then we can have a look at how inconclusive decisions impact error rates. And then at the end, I also want to look into predictive probabilities and errors um, for those. So we're um, working under this overarching objective of the same source problem. So we want to answer whether two pieces of firearms evidence or in case studies. So whether two pieces under a comparison come from the same source. I just see that something happened in the chat. Um, is somebody else going to monitor the chat for me because it's going to be tricky um, to do both. I will. Thank you. Okay, so um, currently um, firearms and tool marks examiners use visual inspection under usually a comparison microscope. And that has, as we all know, come under some criticism um, starting in 2009 by the National Research Council that put firearms and tool mark evidence under on the list of forensic evidence um, where scientific validation is necessary as well as a determination of error rates and some reliability testing. So um, the two goals that CSAFE is taking away from that is to determine scores as quantitative and objective measures for an identification or an elimination in a comparison, just to measure similarity and dissimilarity dissimilarity using a value, and also to establish error rates. So um, how are error rates, um, how, what is an error? That is the question. And that's what we're going to have a closer look at today. So how do we quantify errors? So we should um, work from a couple of premises. So first of all, ground truth doesn't help us with establishing error rates because ground, uh, sorry, <laughs> casework. Um, we need ground truth um, to establish error rates. That's what, what happens when you overpractice a talk. Ground truth um, is needed to establish error rates. So we need to know um, for a comparison whether these two pieces of, um, of evidence, I, I don't wanna call it evidence, whether these two pieces from a comparison come from the same source or whether they come from different sources. So given that we need ground truth, that means that casework um, doesn't allow for assessing errors because in casework, we actually don't know. So that means that we need to use case studies in order to establish error rates. And the first premise would be 
um, the participant, um, so in that case of firearms and tool marks examiner, does not know the ground truth when they do a comparison. So it's a blinded study. Um, the second premise should be that a participant can't infer a conclusion without looking from anything but looking at the two pieces under comparison. So there shouldn't be a logic puzzle involved that um, lets somebody infer that if this matches that and that matches this, then um, the first and the third also match. So there shouldn't be anything like that involved. The gold standard for establishing error rates would be a blind blind study. So the participant doesn't even know that they are being tested at the moment. That is done um, in part for um, some comparisons at Houston. So I've put a link in here um, with a news announcement of, um, of such, um, such a gold standard. In reality, um, this, the gold standard is probably not something that we can easily achieve because it's expensive and cost um, very costly in terms of time and implementation. So in reality, what we will have is that um, participants sign up to a case study that's being sent around and um, usually have to evaluate a number of questioned items and um, do a comparison to a number of reference items. The basis for those um, comparisons is then usually um, based on the FD theory of identifications. So let me just quickly go over this FD range of conclusions. Um, this is um, and this is the established FD range. You can find it on various different training sites and it's um, published in the FD journal. Um, we have a two-step process. At first, suitability is evaluated. So at the, um, so I'm starting here from the bottom. Um, if um, one of the um, pieces under a comparison is um, considered unsuitable for an examination, the process stops there and um, there's no further result. So here we're going to assume that both pieces of both both pieces in the comparison have made it past that suitability. Um, and that means that we will have one of three possible conclusions. Um, there can be an identification, and that means that all discernible class characteristics, um, match and um, there's agreement in individual characteristics. And the agreement exceeds um, to a degree that is consistent um, between tool marks that have been produced by the same tool. So that would be a, that, that's how an identification is defined. On the other end, um, we have the negative side of that. So there's an elimination. If there is um, disagreement in the class characteristics and then FD specifies and or individual class correct, individual characteristics. So in between identification and elimination, we've got three steps of three levels of inconclusives. Um, there is um, inconclusive B, which is a neutral inconclusive. There is some um, agreement and some disagreement, um, but there's not um, a tendency towards either an identification or an elimination. And then on the, on the flip side of those, or on, on the side, on either side of these, on, on this neutral inconclusive, there is Inconclusive A, there's some agreement between individual characteristics and all class characteristics, but not enough agreement for an identification. 
Um, on the other side, there is inconclusive C. There's agreement between all class characteristics, all discernible class characteristics, and some disagreement between individual char characteristics, but not enough to make an elimination. So that's essentially the spectrum of um, conclusions that are allowed under the AFD theory of identifications. And that means that inconclusive results are perfectly fine um, conclusions. And that also means that, um, that we are going to see these inconclusive results in case studies, in case work. And the question is, how do we deal with these inconclusive results when we are trying to establish error rates? So the question is, what makes an error? And here I'm using figure one of a new publication that's come out um, by Draw and Storage, misuse of, misuse of scientific measurements in forensic science. So here is just an overview um, of the table of potential outcomes. So we've got in the columns um, our evidence. So evidence is either same source or different source evidence. And we've got on the other side, three decisions. We've got identifications and exclusions, and then we've got the inconclusives. Which, um, so for identification and exclusion, it's pretty um, simple to see how they match to being correct or wrong for any piece of evidence. So you can see that an identification is correct for same source evidence and an exclusion is correct for different source evidence. Um, the other two possibilities obviously result in errors. Inconclusives are not ever considered to be um, incorrect, which um, means um, while they are being considered as correct um, according to the AFTI rules for errors. So this is an evaluation of a firearms examiner's performance, which um, leads to this slightly strange situation that without even having to make an, a comparison, the result could always be an inconclusive and it would result in a perfect error rate or in, in a perfect result. And that seems um, wrong. So um, another, so we need to think about error rates beyond assessing a firearms examiner's performance. We need to think about the bigger picture. So um, if we, oh, okay, sorry, I'm come, I'm going to come back to that. Um, so obviously these inconclusives are a bit problematic. So the question is, how big is the problem really? So if nobody ever sees any inconclusive results, um, our problem is not really a practical problem and we can just ignore that. So um, let's have a look at how big the problem actually is. So in order to assess the size of our problem, we looked over available um, case studies and we uh, went through a literature review. So we've identified 10 studies that deal with firearms evidence in a case study. And I'm listing them all here. I don't want to go into a massive amount of detail. I just want to um, just list a couple of the most important features. So you can see here that um, we've got studies with um, various numbers of participants. The largest study is the Brundage Hamby study. Um, the smallest study here is um, the Leon studies. Um, we've got um, mostly studies on cartridge cases, but there's also studies on um, bullets themselves, and then also extractor marks, aperture shear marks. Um, and 
even more breach faces. So you can see here, um, there's a couple of very small, um, very small studies and um, another aspect here, DUES and VCME, VCMER bring in a virtual aspect. So these two studies are done using virtual microscopy. Um, so we are going to see that those will result in slightly different results from the other ones. Um, but you can see that there's um, a pretty wide spectrum of different assessment uh, pieces of um, firearms that are under comparison and different numbers of participants. Um, we've also included um, two case studies that um, have a pool of participants outside the US. So Madison and Faid um, both draw from European trained firearms examiners. Um, so we'll see a couple of differences there as well. Okay, so coming back to the question, how big is the problem of inconclusive results? And here we've got an overview of the percentage of inconclusive results across all of these individual case studies. You can see the um, two case studies. Um, Faid is uh, the two case studies from your Euro with European trained examiners. Um, Faid is split into two um, because there's a part on bullets and a part on cartridge cases. We're also not able to identify inconclusive results for Lyon or Hamby um, because there the case studies were only asking for identifications. So um, the, not all comparisons were made. Um, the, compare, the, the case studies were very centered on identifying um, which bullet or cartridge case matched which other bullet or cartridge case. So from the case studies that we're able to use in this case, um, we can see that the percentage of inconclusive results is certainly not trivial. So it goes up to almost 50% of comparisons that result in inconclusive results. And um, you can see the, the larger, for the larger case studies like Madison or the Baldwin study, the interval around those percentages are fairly small, indicating that there's a large number of comparison that goes into this um, into this in, in this percentage. So the intervals give us a given by 95% exact um, confidence intervals. So inconclusive results are not a trivial problem. Um, so AFTI rules treat an examiner's error as um, so in, treat inconclusives as not part of an examiner's error. Um, on the other side, we can think of the overall process. Um, so the overall process consists of same source pieces, same source comparisons and different source comparisons. And those same source and different source comparisons should result in a either identification or a elimination. So in terms from of a bigger point of view, if the process does not allow us to either say this is an identification or an elimination, something went wrong. And that doesn't mean that the firearm examiner is doing anything wrong. It just means that these comparisons do not allow us to make that um, decision. And that could be because the firing process didn't um, go as, or there's, there's something happened in the firing process. Maybe something happened to um, the piece um, after it was um, emitted from the firearm and it hit a wall or a bone or something. Um, 
it's um or um the or there's just not a lot of marks transferred onto the um the piece of the bullet so um draw and scourge in their 2020 paper suggest to expand on evidence and think of evidence as coming from three th three sources same source different source and an inconclusive source however that looks like um, but if we have three sources we can easily match that those three sources to three conclusions and then we just um, say that we don't know how to produce inconclusive evidence um, so we're not going to assume that inconclusive evidence is there which means that um, so by by definition inconclusive results are counted as errors in the process so you can see that this is um, a quite different approach to defining um, inconclusive results and now an inconclusive result always results in an error, regardless of whether this is a same source piece of comparison or a different source comparison. Um, so besides these two extremes, um, we can, um, so our idea is we can assume that inconclusive decisions are just not a final decision. They're an intermediate step that's allowed to firearms examiners but for the overall process really we only distinguish between this is an identification or this is not an identification so rather than expanding on the number of evidence sources we're cutting down on um, the participants decision and binarize that participants decision so um, we are just saying um, an exclusion is not an identification inconclusive results are also not an identification, which also means that um, inconclusives are now um, dealt, dealt with in the same way as um, an elimination. So same source evidence would result in an error, different source evidence would be counted as correct. And um, so inconclusive results are counted as exclusion or elimination or just not as an identification. What does that give us? We can define anything as an error. The question is, um, what would be a good and um, transparent and principled way of defining an error? So let's have a look at, um, so this is, this is the overview there's something going on at the bottom but um, essentially you can see how these um, three different types of errors just um, differ in the in the way that inconclusives are counted under AFTI rules inconclusives are correct um, in terms of a process error inconclusives are wrong under the third rule inconclusives would be counted in the same way as exclusions so let's have a look at results. So if we're looking at the 10 studies that we've considered or that we were able to consider, um, let's have a look at the rate of missed identifications. So these are same source comparisons that were not identified as same source comparisons. And that number should be very, very small. So that is the error rate or error percentages here. And you can see that for AFTI trained examiners, so examiners from the US and Canada, you can see that all the studies and all across all of those error rates are very, very small. There's a slight difference to the VCMER study where um, the process error and the elimination or in the inconclusives are um, eliminations are higher 
So that might be because this is a virtual study or use, is this is a study that uses virtual comparisons. Um, but beyond that, all of the AFTI trained, uh, all of the studies with AFTI trained examiners have very small errors, um, regardless of how we treat inconclusive results. So no, that's good. Um, what about missed elimination? So these, this is the percentage of different source comparisons that were not excluded. Under the process error, so where we treat all of the inclusive, inconclusive results as errors, you can see how this really increases the amount, the, the percentage of errors that happens um, up to almost 60% for bunch. Um, but what you can also see is that the AFTI um, error, as well as treating inconclusives as eliminations, um, pretty much agree. There's almost no difference between the errors um, for counting inconclusives as eliminations. So there's a lot of support for not distinguishing between three items or three pieces, uh, three levels of conclusions, um, but just distinguishing between this is an identification and this is not an identification would allow us to keep error rates for firearms examiners and the overall process error rates to be very, very similar and very small overall. What, um, so this trade-off is more principled than just having this sort of what feels like a cop-out um, level. Um, so looking, I, I th it's much more principled to look at comparisons from the process view, um, because we need to come to a conclusion that is actually actionable on. And we know how to act on an identification. We know how to act on an elimination. We do not know how to act on an inconclusive. So in that sense, um, defining an error for inconclusives is more principled. What, um, so let me switch gears um, because now I'm actually making the claim that the error rates that um, we were just looking at are actually not that interesting in a legal situation and that we should look at a different kind of error rate anyways. So what we really want in a legal situation is we want to know what, an ex what a testimony actually means in terms of the source of the evidence. So if we're looking at the predictive probabilities, so given an examiner's conclusion, what is the probability that these two pieces came from the same source? What's the probability that these two pieces came from a different source? So that's what I meant by actionable items. We know how to act on same source versus different source. And we would like to know that if an examiner says X, what's the probability that the evidence actually is X? So let's have a look at the case studies under this premise. So let's assume the examiner made an identification and here we're looking at the probability that the comparisons was made on same source pieces. And you can see that here the probability is almost 100% for all of the AFD trained examiners. So well above 95%. Um, you can see here we want 
to hit the target of 100%. The target are those little bull eyes, bullseyes. Um, you can see that um, the confidence interval for sure um, hits, most, uh, hits that bullseye mostly for the AFTI trained examiners. Um, the European studies are a little bit different. Um, there might also be an, a component that, the, that these European um, type studies were not just proficiency, but actually performance exams um, that were trying to come up with pretty hard comparisons. So here we've got um, the probability same source given the examiner said it was an identification. So that's really great. So on the other side, <clears throat> if the examiner says an exclusion was made, what's the probability that in fact it's actually a same source? So this is an error rate. What's the probability for same source given that the examiner said um, this is an exclusion? And you can see here that the error rates here are even smaller than um, before. So it, the probability that something is from the same source given an examiner said this is an exclusion is well below 1%. Again, European type studies are a bit different. So now um, what, how are we going to deal with an examiner says this is an inconclusive result. So we can assume that um, because the AFTI rules are for inconclusives are really symmetric. So we've got inconclusives A, B, and C. Um, we can assume that an inconclusive result should be independent of the source. So it should be independent of whether something is from the same source or from different sources, assuming that it's this, that the difficulty to identify similarities is the same as identifying dissimilarities. So assuming that that's the case, we can use expected values um, for, um, these pro for the probability here and the targets, those bull eyes, give us the expected values under this assumption that it's um, that making an identification is as equally hard as making a elimination. So <clears throat> what does the error studies, what, does, what do the case studies say? The case studies, um, so the European case studies are the only one, or two of the European case studies are the only ones that actually include that expected value. All of the other studies are significantly below the expected value. So, and you can see here that all of these, the probability that something is from the same source, given that the examiner says they're from, given an inconclusive result, from the examiner are very, very small. So <clears throat> there's really large and significant differences between these expected and observed probabilities. And that means that there's a more than 95% chance that if an AFTI trained examiner says something is inconclusive, it's really an uh, it should really be an elimination. So it really is from a different source. What does that tell us? Um, so I've, I've thrown a ton of numbers at you. Um, we've tried to come up with a worksheet that helps with all of these um, all of to, to, with a spreadsheet that helps to keep all of these pieces straight. Um, so you can follow that um, link, this bit.ly link to our Google spreadsheet. Um, here we've got um, 
the results from the Baldwin study. So overall, there were 3,270 com comparisons made. Um, 1,090 were from same source comparisons. Um, 2,180 were from different source comparisons. And you can see the results in that table in between. Um, so those six numbers essentially determine all of those error rates that I've been talking about. So let's have a look at um, the, the different approaches of counting inconclusives. So if we, if we look at given an elimination was made, what's the probability for same source? So that would be an error. And you can see that only four comparisons of same source material resulted in an um, oh, hang on. Um, only, um, so given that an elimination was made, so that's 1,425 comparisons, only four came from same sources. So that's an error rate of um, maybe three in a thousand, below three, the, in that three in a thousand. If we also count inconclusive results, in there, so an inconclusive or an elimination was made, that probability for same source goes up a little bit to 15 over um, 21 something hundred. Um, so the, res the error rate goes up a little bit, but not by much. So it doesn't, it barely changes. So missed, missed identifications are not, um, not affected by how we treat, whether we treat inconclusives as eliminations or not. What happens with missed eliminations? So if a firearms examiner in the Baldwin study says that something is an identification, so that happened in 1097 cases, 22 of them were actually from different source. So that's an error rate of about two in a hundred. So that's tenfold the missed identification error. Um, so it's still small, but you can see that it's about tenfold higher than the missed identification. Not quite tenfold. Um, if we also include the inconclusives, so if an examiner says that this is an inconclusive or an identification, the probability that it actually is from a different source is suddenly at 40%. So that's huge. So that means that missing an elimination is happening at a much, much higher rate than missing an identification so the probability for failing to eliminate is much, much higher than failing to identify. That is a problem. So um, this is, again, um, similar to what I was showing before. Um, and so just to summarize, um, we need to have a look at the bigger picture of considering process and the results in that process rather than just measuring how one firearm examiner is doing. So the, the objective shouldn't be um, to, to just focus on what, what somebody is doing wrong. Um, that's absolutely not the focus here. Um, the focus is much, much more on the bigger picture of what went wrong in the process. Um, because we start with something and we don't end with the same thing. So we really need to um, take this bigger picture of the process result into account. And what we've seen is that if we just distinguish between identifications and no identifications, we can have um, the best of both worlds. So error rates don't change that much 
um, from AFTI era rights, and we would have a more principled approach. For legal situations, I we would suggest that predictive probabilities are more informative. And looking at these predictive probabilities, we see that we've got higher error rates um, when for eliminations. So there's a failure to eliminate um, rather than a failure to identify. And that can have mm, various reasons. So some labs don't allow exclusions based on just individual characteristics. Some labs just allow allow exclusion, exclusions just on class characteristics. So sort of the, the most severe dissimilarity could be captured as an inconclusive result to see. Um, so that um, would be a, an argument in favor of just distinguishing between identification and not an identification. Um, the other potential reason why making inconclusion ex, making exclusions is maybe making maybe finding dissimilarities might be a cognitively harder task um so maybe there would be a way to change um training in a way that um trains more for looking at these differences and for judging those judging and assessing those differences because otherwise the, the statistics just speak against. Um, so we've, we see in the statistics that there's a much higher error rate for eliminations than for identifications. And it would be good to, it, it's really necessary to follow up on these. So this is it from me. Um, we've got a paper that's just been accepted by Law, Probability and Risk called Treatment of Inconclusives in the AFTI Range of Conclusions um, that should be coming out soon. I'm sure that we can also um, send out preprints or publish a preprint on the website if there's interest. And I'm open for questions now. Heike, are you able to see the Q&A portion? I'm not sure. I'll try, but I can't find, I, I don't have my mouse. Let me see. Uh, okay. Okay. There's a bunch of uh, yes. questions. Okay. Um, from the bottom or the top? The bottom one, the top ones are the okay. other ones. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me just, uh, I'm really sorry, I didn't see the questions as they were coming in. Um, let me start from the back. So Robert, yes, I completely agree with you that maybe identifications and exclusions, uh, that there's a difference um, in how difficult they are. Um, so that needs to be addressed. So I think we agree in this. You might want to start Heike from the top because some of the questions build on okay. earlier questions. Okay. okay. Um, I'm really sorry, I don't know the context of the first question? I don't think, I think it referred to some letter that um, Weller and Morris had sent to a journal in response to the uh, drawer and scourge article, but I said we probably hadn't seen that. Yeah. So. Okay, so I believe that the error rate for Oh, okay, so which error rate? I need to look up the error rate specified in the PCAST report, and I'll come back to that question on whether this is 
whether the overall error rates in the studies is still below 5%. But I don't think that the error rates change a lot. And I believe that the PCAST report should also um, consider the process error rather than just an examiner error. Okay, I did not know that having a gun or not having a gun um, makes a difference. I, I guess it should. Um, so the, one of the problems that we have is that it's not completely clear which rules labs use when they eliminate or what would go into an what would go into considering an elimination. Melissa, I, I agree. So um, it, it is always hard um, with the um, missing eliminations. Um, it's, I'm not saying that examiners miss the eliminations. It's more that an elimination was missed in the process. So I really don't want to blame examiners. I want to look at the bigger picture and something went wrong in the process might be a better way of saying that an elimination was missed. Heike, if you could read the question that you're addressing before you answer it, that might be helpful oh, to I'm so other sorry. folks. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought that I was still sharing my screen. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned um, right. before Melissa, there was a question from Christoph Dion. Oh, they've changed. Oh. Okay. Um, they also keep changing. Um, oh no. Okay. Okay, so question from Ted Forberger for your second to last slide for real casework that denominators would be much larger. It raises the possibility that examiners treat test results the way they treat real cases. I absolutely agree um, that case studies might be different from actual casework. That's why I would love to have actual, um, the, the actual gold standard implemented where, um, um, where comparisons are snuck into casework and examiners don't know that they are being um, evaluated or because I would very much like to have a baseline for the distribution of the results. So how often does something end up in, because we only have that baseline for case studies and case studies are just very clean cut. And we, we don't, I'm not sure that we can assume that case studies are similar, to, similar enough to casework to transfer those probabilities into case, uh, to transfer probabilities that we get from case studies to um, casework situations. Richard, there has recently been debate around PCAST's view that rates of error and inconclusive response increase as we go from closed set to partially open set to black box pairwise study designs how does your data and approach, if at all, impact that debate? Um, that's a good question. We've got, um, so we've got several open set studies and a couple of black box studies. And essentially what we were trying to do was to move the, the question of whether something is um, to, to move the comparisons into independent comparisons. So if we've got a closed set study, um, we can fill in this logic puzzle that I mentioned earlier. So if A matches B and B matches C, then without even looking at A and C, we know that they should match too. And um, similarly, if A matches B and we know that nothing else um, matches B, then obviously C, D, E, and F also don't match B because they are not A. 
So those kind of um, things can happen in a closed set study and that affects the dependence or those are dependencies that affect the error rates. So in our assessment, we were trying to be very, very careful about defining how many different source comparisons and how many same source comparisons were being made. And that's one reason why we couldn't actually evaluate Hamby and Leon's for um, different source comparisons because there was such a strong focus on just making an identification that um, different source comparisons weren't really, weren't reported. So we didn't want to assume that every single different source, or we couldn't assume that every different single source, every single different source comparison was being made, but it's tricky. Hi, Kat. Alicia and Susan, I want to let you know that we have about three minutes left okay. to answer some last yes. questions. Yeah, and I hope that we can just answer those questions in more detail offline afterwards. So we can type up answers and send out the Q&A maybe? Sure, we can make that part of the follow-up email for folks. Okay. So one last question, Michelle, wouldn't it be most fair at this point to report definite errors, eliminating IDs and vice versa, separate from inconclusives, especially if with studies, examiners cannot make additional tests as they would with casework. Okay, so I'm not completely sure how definite errors. So by definite errors, I'm assuming that AFTI, that you're thinking of AFTI rules. So eliminating IDs and vice versa. Yeah, so that would be, so exclude all of the inconclusives and only count, um, so exclude all inconclusives. That's another way of dealing with inconclusives to completely disregard those inconclusives. I, okay, so in that case, I think the question comes up again, how different is casework from these case studies? Because in the Baldwin study, for example, 40% of the comparisons resulted in in, in an inconclusive. And I'm not sure what kind of follow-up tests would be made in, um, in an actual lab, but I think that falls under the header of these case studies are not particularly suited to come up with error rates for casework. So we would need other ways of establishing error rates. Heike, Alicia, Susan, thank you so much for uh, sharing this research with us and, and providing us with this.